Thank you all for joining the ECB in Focus webinar series. Um, I'm uh, Luke Laffen, the Director of Research here at the ECB, and today our speaker is Stuart Russell, who is a Professor of Computer Science at UC Berkeley. He's originally from the UK, where he studied physics before he moved to the United States in the early 80s, where he completed his PhD in Computer Science. He has made seminal contributions to the field of artificial intelligence, such as new methods for inverse reinforcement learning that allow to infer people's objectives, values, or rewards by observing their behavior. And his textbook, Artificial Intelligence, a Modern Approach, is the most widely used textbook on artificial intelligence worldwide. And when reading it, I was very pleased to see several chapters uh, summarizing the field of microeconomic theory, me being an economist. Um, we can argue about that later, whether that's economics or artificial intelligence. So today, Stuart will talk to us about AI concepts, trends and coexistence. This is a hugely important and timely topic for us at the ECB, as we are in the process of developing our AI strategy. Stuart is the ideal speaker on the topic, having been at the heart of the field of AI over the past four decades. He is deeply aware of both the opportunities as well as the risks that AI offers. He has been an advocate of fostering so-called human-compatible artificial intelligence, whereby artificial intelligence respects human values. The format of today's one-hour webinar is as follows. Professor Russell will give a presentation for about 40 minutes, followed by Q&A. I will lead the Q&A by collecting your questions via the chat function. And now, Stuart, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Luke. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Um, unfortunately, I can't manage my presentation myself. Uh, due to some problem with teams. So uh, I think Anna is going to uh, help me. So let's look at the next slide. Um, and uh, so I'm going to very briefly cover some of the prehistory and history of AI. Um, actually, these are slides from uh, the opening lecture of my undergraduate course uh, and the, taking material from the textbook that Luke mentioned. Um, and then I'll talk briefly about uh, what happens if uh, the field of AI succeeds in its long-term goal, which is to create machines that are more intelligent than human beings. Um, and uh, we'll see that that doesn't necessarily go well. Uh, and the last part, we'll briefly talk about how we might uh, make sure that it does go well by building AI systems that we can be sure uh, will be safe and beneficial to human beings. Okay, next. Um, so everyone thinks that AI is a very recent field, but it's just a, in some sense, it's a renaming of something that we've been trying to do for thousands of years, which is to understand how our own minds operate um, and to do so in a way that um, can uh, predict and analyze and perhaps uh, reproduce. Um, so, for example, uh, if you want to understand how reasoning works, um, this is something that philosophers have studied uh, uh, since at least the um, ancient Greeks formalized uh, logic back in around uh, four, four to five hundred years uh, BC, and um, they also uh, thought about planning, for example. So uh, Aristotle very clearly describes uh, what we would now call a goal regression planning algorithm, um, where you start from the goal and you work backwards through possible actions until uh, until you get to something that's true in uh, in the present, and then you run, run those actions forward to achieve a goal. Um, and uh, uh, Aristotle also talked about uh, the perils of automation. Um, so if you'd like to look at the um, the next, uh, just click once. Um, there's a, a quote from Aristotle. Uh, 
if every instrument could accomplish its own work, obeying or anticipating the will of others, if in like manner the shuttle would weave and the plectrum touch the lyre without a hand to guide them, chief workmen would not want servants nor masters slaves. So uh, here, there he is in 350 BC talking about technological unemployment uh, as a result of artificial intelligence. Um, okay, next. Uh, so um, in mathematics, there was uh, a lot of work in um, both in the ancient Greek period and um, in the early Renaissance and then through the 19th century on formalizing logic as, as a mathematical model of correct reasoning. Uh, probability theory got going, got going in the 17th century um, and uh, more recently, uh, well, I say more recently, uh, late 17th century, uh, Isaac Newton and others developed um, some of the first methods for optimization of functions, and uh, and that's the basis for machine learning algorithms today. Uh, neuroscientists, sorry, good, if we can go back, uh, neuroscientists studied um, the brain, and uh, in the late 19th century, uh, figured out that it was made of neurons. Um, and, uh, and that those neurons could adapt uh, in response to stimuli. And so that led um, by the 1940s to computational models of neural systems, um, which are probably the most direct predecessors of deep learning methods from today. Uh, and economics ha had a, uh, an enormous role to play because it, it's uh, it studied uh, the whole notion of rational decisions. Uh, I think the concept of utility from Bernoulli and others is extremely important. Um, and we'll see that uh, the way we've thought about uh, intelligence in AI since the beginning is based in part on this notion of uh, a rational agent. Um, so in 1842, um, Babbage designed a universal machine and uh, Ada Lovelace, who worked with Babbage, actually wrote that, um, that such a machine uh, could be, if appropriately programmed, could be a, a, a thinking machine for all subjects in the universe. Um, so that's a pretty similar idea to what you might see in the late 1940s or 1950 from um, people like Alan Turing, um, except that it was 100 years earlier. The problem that uh, Babbage and Lovelace faced was that they couldn't build their universal machine. Uh, and had they built it, it probably would have run um, a lot slower than uh, the computers we have today. Uh, it would have been made of brass with cog wheels and uh, crankshafts and so on. And um, uh, we, it might still be running today trying to calculate uh, something very simple. So uh, if we go to the next slide, um, the, the official birth of AI was a workshop held in uh, Dartmouth um, in New Hampshire in 1956. And um, it was a proposal from four people, including the two on the left, John McCarthy, who was a, uh, an untenured uh, mathematician at, uh, I think at MIT at the time, and Claude Shannon, uh, who was already a very uh, well-established uh, theoretician who had developed um, information theory and had actually proposed the idea that computers should work with um, binary arithmetic zeros and ones uh, as well. So um, that workshop proposal basically brought together almost all the people who were thinking about making these newfangled computing devices intelligent. Um, they had several demonstrations of successful programs, including um, chess programs and uh, programs that could prove theorems in geometry 
and so on. But they were incredibly optimistic about progress. Um, so they thought that if if these men, as they call them, uh, could get together for a summer, uh, they'd be able to make significant progress on a whole range of problems um, that they listed. Uh, so it took a bit longer than that. Uh, and of course, we're still working on it. Next slide. Uh, so if we just step through this, um, the uh, as I mentioned, the, the first computational models of uh, intelligence were actually based on, uh, on neural networks. So a famous paper by McCulloch and Pitts, 1943, um, uh, sim simplified, uh, obviously, what real neurons do down to um, uh, a model in which each neuron is either on or off, so they're um, uh, strictly binary, um, but they're on or off depending on uh, their neighboring neurons and what signals those neighboring neurons are sending, and whether a weighted combination of those neighboring signals uh, exceeds some threshold, uh, in which case the neuron uh, turns on. And they showed that this was capable of a wide range of computations. Um, and that was really the basis for artificial neural networks and deep learning for today. Uh, and 1950, uh, Turing's paper on computing machinery and intelligence was, I would say, really the um, sort of the starting pistol for the field of AI, even though it wasn't called AI at that time. Uh, the paper uh, sets out many of the areas of AI that we are familiar with today. It even proposes that the easiest way to build AI systems uh, is to train uh, to train a blank slate on lots of data um, rather than try to program uh, everything into it. Um, so the first 20 years, uh, sometimes called the look ma no hands era. So this is like a, a child who's just learning to ride a bicycle and, and showing off that they can do it with no hands. Um, and, uh, and this is because there was not that much theory uh, of what was going on. And uh, what, a lot of what was done was take some aspect of intelligence, like playing chess or solving mathematical problems or translating from one language into another or passing an IQ test. And then um, you'd simply write a program that did that thing and then you demonstrated that the program did it uh, without any theory uh, as to what was you know what was really going on what type of problem solving what type of reasoning how general was your approach none of those things mattered it was more the ability to show that you could actually do it but there were some really important steps even in that period so the um, uh, the checkers program of Arthur Samuel, which was demonstrated on television in 1957, um, used reinforcement learning. And it was the uh, exact predecessor of uh, AlphaGo, which um, 60 years later uh, defeated the human world champion at Go. But it's essentially the same program, uh, just that AlphaGo was using a million, million, million times more computation, so 10 to the 18 times as much computation uh, as uh, Arthur Samuel's checker playing program. Um, so most people would say, you know, Go is more difficult, but it's not 10 to the 18 times more difficult than checkers. It's maybe three times more difficult. Uh, and so um, that was an amazing achievement uh, for the 1950s. Um, another important thing, uh, 1965, uh, Robinson, developed the resolution algorithm, which is a complete algorithm for reasoning in first order logic. So what does that mean? It means that the so first order logic is, is a mathematical uh, framework in which pretty much all uh, definite statements can be expressed, uh, including almost all the mathematics, um, but lots of other stuff about common sense or tax law or, uh, you know, uh, any, anything that we can write down in a definite form. And the algorithm is able to answer any question 
uh, with respect to any uh, set of um, facts or uh, rules that can be written in first order logic. So already by 1965, that was a, uh, a step towards a complete general purpose artificial intelligence. Uh, so in the 70s, there was uh, uh, the beginning of what we call expert systems, so systems that did reasoning using often somewhat restricted forms of, uh, of Robinson's algorithm um, and uh, large amounts of knowledge to solve important problems that industry cared about. And this led to a boom, not unlike the boom we're experiencing today, um, with the exception that instead of producing AI systems by training on lots of data, as is common now, uh, they were produced by you know, interviewing experts and writing down what those experts knew uh, in some uh, formalism, and then the AI system would reason with that knowledge to solve problems. Uh, there was a huge amount of excitement, loads of startup companies, lots of investment, um, but the technology was not really uh, robust or general enough to support the level of investment. Uh, and so it collapsed very, very quickly. Uh, once people start saying, you know, we're spending all this money and we're not getting a lot of return, uh, then all of a sudden everyone runs for the exit, not wanting to be the last person holding the baby, so to speak. And, uh, and, and it collapsed within less than a year, I would say, that, that bubble burst. And then um, in the last 30 years or so, uh, there's been much more focus on learning as a method of constructing AI systems, uh, much more technical depth. So I would say in many areas, work in AI uh, has uh, you know, exceeded some of its predecessor disciplines, such as statistics um, and operations research. Uh, and uh, I dare to say even some work in game theory uh, is, is pretty interesting. So next slide. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, the last part, uh, just that last um, bullet point. So as we're all aware, we're now back in the area, in the era of of deep learning, and to some extent, we have lost uh, touch with all of the theoretical foundations that we developed. Uh, and we're back in this period where we just build big systems, uh, and then we try them out and see what they do, and we say, wow, look at that, isn't that amazing? So it's very important to understand that um, the large language models like ChatGPT that many of you are familiar with, are um, completely mysterious even to their creators. So we have no idea what's going on. We have no idea what they're capable of, uh, what they're not capable of, why they take so long to learn some things, but learn other things very quickly um, and, and say very stupid things uh, on, on occasion. Um, and nonetheless, they are finding many applications both in uh, industry and commerce, but also um, in the sciences, and I think that the scientific applications may be uh, the most lasting contribution from this period. Okay, next slide. Um, so this is another slide from the undergraduate course, and it explains that the way we think about AI um, is as uh, designing agents. So agents, I think it's a somewhat similar word in economics, um, but it, it doesn't have the connotation that the agent is working for somebody. Uh, this is just uh, something that perceives and acts by itself. So the diagram on the bottom right uh, is, is the basic concept that you have an agent operating connected by sensors and actuators to an environment. Um, and then uh, that, that loop operates um, to, to uh, generate behavior. And so in the course, we use Pac-Man, uh, the video game, as uh, a running example to illustrate lots of different concepts. Um, and so uh, what we want is not just any old agent, but we want the rational agent. Um, and so that's uh, an agent that maximizes its, its uh, expected utility. And there are, there's a lot of caveats to that statement. Um, so maximizing is computationally intractable. So it, in general, 
uh, real agents are not going to be perfectly rational. Um, it uh, is a question, uh, where does it get its utility function from? And uh, in some AI methods, we implant it directly uh, by specifying uh, a reward function, for example, which is an ad a temporally additive utility function, um, or a logical goal, uh, as you might see in your uh, GPS navigation system where you specify the destination. Um, in other cases, it might be implicit, as we'll see later on with large language models. Um, and it's important to understand that um, within that general framework, there are many different types of agents. Um, and, and to a large extent, the type of agent that you build uh, depends on how it's going to be connected to its environment and the properties um, of that environment. So we, if we continue, um, we'll, the, the main thing we're teaching in this course is what are those different kinds of environments and ways of connecting the agent to the environment and how do they dictate the appropriate um, AI method that can be used. So I wanted to briefly mention, um, this is one of the asides that I promised. If you, uh, if you take the idea of a rational agent literally, and say, okay, we're going to build something that maximizes its expected utility. You can often do that. Uh, for example, it's easy to write a chess program that simply plays the correct move. Um, by solving the entire game tree of chess, uh, which would take, um, even on the biggest computers we have now, uh, that would take um, probably millions of years of compute time. Uh, we have done it for checkers, so we now have a complete solution for checkers. Uh, but for Go, it would take you know, many, many universes of, of time to solve Go exactly. So this is not a new idea in economics. Uh, Simon wrote about bounded rationality back in the 50s, and uh, there has been a lot of work uh, in economics, mainly on descriptive models of bounded rationality. Um, but in AI, we develop this concept of bounded optimality, which means that um, e even though you have a finite computer to run it on, so you can't be perfectly rational, um, there is some equivalence class of programs uh, that can run on that computer, which um, are actually the best programs uh, that can exist uh, in terms of uh, producing utility. And this, this notion of bounded optimality is, uh, if you go to just one more bullet, um, is both normative uh, and realizable. So unlike perfect rationality, which is normative but not realizable, um, this notion is, and there's uh, some uh, quite interesting theory uh, allowing you to, for example, compose bounded optimal systems uh, to uh, with a, with a, within a given computational skeleton to optimize the allocation of computational resources uh, to produce bounded optimal systems, uh, to learn how to be bounded optimal uh, and prove that a, a given learning method converges to a bounded optimal solution in the limit, uh, and so on. Okay, next slide. Um, so just, uh, just step through these. There are seven or eight of them. Um, so this just illustrates how the properties of the environment uh, affect the way we design uh, the, the AI system that can operate successfully in that environment. For example, partially observable environments, uh, that means that your perception does not tell you the entire state of the world, uh, which is almost always the case. Um, so if the world is partially observable, then your, uh, your intelligent agent is going to have to have some memory of what's happened in the past uh, in order to, to make inferences about the parts of the world that it can't directly perceive. Um, uh, Multi-agent environments are ones where um, the, uh, there are parts of the environment that 
uh, act as agents. Um, and so uh, that leads you into game theory uh, and the possibility of needing, needing to behave randomly uh, in that kind of environment. Um, and maybe I'll just mention the last one. Uh, if the system doesn't know what objective it's supposed to be pursuing, um, but is designed so that it uh, wants to help a human being uh, achieve the human's objective, then there's going to have to be a, a, a closed loop interaction with the human. Uh, and, and this connects up with um, principal agent games in economics. And I'll talk a bit more about that later on. Okay, next slide. Uh, okay, I think, uh, yeah, we will have to just page through this. So this just um, outlines the different parts of the of the AI course along three axes. Um, so the, uh, the the green axis uh, talks about whether we're dealing with deterministic worlds, um, such as uh, chess and um, theorem proving and uh, reasoning about taxes and so on, or a stochastic world um, where uh, there's in inherent uncertainty in the way we have to represent and reason about the world. Um, the blue axis talks about the level of sophistication of the representation uh, of the world. And so atomic means that uh, we think of the states of the world simply as points, uh, having no internal structure. And so all of the search algorithms, so your GPS navigation algorithm, uh, thinks of the world as points connected into a, a network uh, and then is just searching for a path um, through that network of points. The same goes for chess programs. They think of the world as just states of the board and uh, they're searching through a game tree where each node in the tree corresponds to a different state of the chess board. Um, and those were the first categories of algorithms to really be worked out successfully in, uh, in AI. Uh, factored representations are um, where the state of the world is broken down into a, if you like, a vector, uh, so a, a set of features, um, and propositional or Boolean logic has that characteristic. Neural networks also have that characteristic. Um, and then the structured representations are things like first order logic or in general computer programs where the state of the world uh, is, is a much more complex structure rather than a Rather than thinking of it as sort of a vector of bits, uh, think of it as a representation in terms of objects, relations among those objects, uh, function symbols connecting objects to objects, and so on. Um, and I'll briefly mention what happens when, when structured representations and stochastic worlds uh, come together you know, in a field called probabilistic programming later on, but we don't teach that in the undergraduate course. Okay, next slide. Um, so, probabilistic program, as I said, is what happens when structured representations and probability theory come together. Um, and uh, structured representations are what we call Turing equivalent, meaning that if you can represent um, in, in one of these structured representations, such as a programming language like Python or first order logic, then those are, those are sufficiently expressive that they can express anything that you can represent in any formal language, and you can do so relatively concisely. So just to give you an example, if I, if I write down the rules of Go in first order logic, um, it's less than one page of, of axioms. If I try to write down the rules of Go in a circuit language, uh, such as a neural network or a Boolean circuit, um, it might be uh, the representation of the rules would, might be about a million pages and they would still be incomplete because uh, in a circuit language, you can't represent the rules of Go for a board of arbitrary size. You can only do it for a fixed size board. Uh, and, and this is incredibly important because the size of the representation determines how much data you need to learn it. Uh, and in fact, we've shown that even the superhuman Go programs have not learned the rules of Go correctly. 
uh, and that allows uh, an ordinary human player to beat the superhuman Go programs very easily. Um, so uh, that, that came as a bit of a surprise to, uh, to the Go players. But with these tools, and I'll show you a probabilistic program in a second, uh, we can create incredibly powerful tools for modeling very complex systems, uh, including stochasticity, uh, and we can, we can have general purpose uh, inference and learning algorithms to go along with that modeling language. So next slide. Uh, so just step through this. So um, I'll, I'll show, okay, that's good. I'll, I'll show an application to the, uh, the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, or CTBT, which has a global uh, network of monitoring stations, the IM International Monitoring System, shown at the top right. So the entire world is covered with uh, seismic, hydroacoustic, and infrasound detector stations. And the goal is to take the data from those stations. Here I'm showing some of the seismic data in the middle. Uh, and then at the bottom, we produce a daily bulletin saying here are all the seismic events that occurred in the last 24 hours, uh, their locations, their depths, their magnitudes, and so on. And um, so we can do that as, as a parabolistic uh, reasoning problem where the evidence is the data collected from the detector stations. Uh, the question you want to answer is what happened today? And uh, the, the probability model can describe both uh, the geophysics of uh, how, how and where events are likely to occur, how um, signals are transmitted, whether those are seismic waves of various kinds or um, uh, acoustic waves in the ocean, uh, how they're transmitted, how they're detected, and uh, and then uh, the background noise that exists in the world. So next slide. So this is the parabolistic program that we wrote. Um, it took about half an hour to write, and uh, this is the monitoring system for the nuclear test ban treaty. And it works about three times better than uh, the accumulated efforts of seismologists over nearly 100 years to develop a, uh, a real-time global monitoring system for seismic events. Uh, and next slide. Um, so this just shows the successful real-time detection of a nuclear explosion in North Korea uh, that was also localized much more accurately than uh, the seismologists were able to do themselves. Um, so the point here, I'm not going to explain in detail how these modeling languages work, but the point being that there are now uh, these very powerful tools that can describe uh, very complex systems, can uh, incorporate uh, all kinds of data from many different sources, uh, and then answer complex questions, uh, do simulations, uh, learn predictive models, and so on. OK, next slide. So um, I'll try to speed up a little bit. Uh, all right, so if we succeed in creating general purpose AI, meaning AI systems that can do anything human beings could do, then by definition, we can do what we can already do, right? So humans can already <clears throat> produce a civilization that offers a good standard of living to many people. So think about, you know, the... Uh, G the per capita GDP of Norway, around $100,000 a person. So if we were able to have that for everybody, because we can uh, use AI systems and robotics uh, to deliver our civilization on a much bigger scale at, at almost no cost, right? We could then just uh, ha allow everyone on Earth to have that standard of living. Uh, and that net present value of that uh, advance would be about $15 quadrillion. So that's a lower bound on the value of general purpose AI as a technology. Uh, and it's a lower bound because there's a lot more we could do besides, right? We could probably have much better individualized healthcare, um, individual tutoring for every child on earth that would allow them to, to learn faster and better and achieve their potential. Um, we're already seeing acceleration in scientific advances using AI tools and so on. 
So this is the upside. This is the magnet in the future that is pulling us towards uh, general purpose AI. And the closer we get, the stronger the magnetic field. Uh, and it's creating a sort of unstoppable momentum. Next slide. So this is one other consequence of what happens if we succeed, right? This is a scene from Wall-E where, um, where humans are, are looked after by robots and the robots run, sorry, back again, the robots run the civilization. And, uh, and so humans no longer need to understand how their own civilization works. Uh, and so they don't. Uh, and this is a significant problem. And I think economists are now finally waking up, having denied the possibility of technological unemployment for a long time. They're now waking up to the idea that uh, actually uh, it could really happen. There'd still be lots of employment. It just be it would just be employment of AI systems and robots, not of humans. Next slide. So this is uh, Alan Turing, and his prediction for what happens if we succeed was uh, at some stage, therefore, we should have to expect the machines to take control. Uh, and this is also a pretty obvious conclusion. If you make systems uh, that are more intelligent, they're going to have more power than we do. Next slide. So this is the question we face, right? How do we retain power over entities more powerful than us forever? And I think this is what Turing was asking himself and decided that he couldn't answer it. But if we rewrite the problem in a slightly different way uh, and ask, what should we, we build AI to do, right? Instead of saying, okay, we have to build AI as a kind of new version of human intelligence, which is the way we've been thinking about it. Uh, we can decide what problems we want AI to solve, right? We can decide this is the mathematical framework. Um, this is the definition of the AI problem. Uh, and we're going to build machines that solve this definition of the problem and not that one. Um, so the definition that we've been pursuing for most of the history of AI is optimize this fixed objective. So we specify a goal or a re reward function or a utility function. And then we build a rational agent, and then we use that to, uh, you know, to achieve that objective. And that works in, in simple problems like chess, where the objective is fixed and given, um, but it doesn't work in the real world. And we can see that uh, in the optimization of quarterly profits, uh, where, um, for example, that's why we have a climate disaster, because we optimized quarterly profits or some some subset of the human race optimize quarterly profits at the expense of the rest. Um, you know, economists worry about, you know, is GDP the right objective? And everyone knows that it isn't, but we still continue to try to optimize it. Um, and then worse, as we'll see, the large language models are not even given a fixed objective. Um, they're simply trained to imitate uh, human behavior, uh, which turns out to be a worse thing to do. Next slide. So here's one approach, um, which is what we want is AI systems that act in the best interests of humans, but we can't write down what those best interests are. And so the machines are going to have to know that they don't know what those human interests are. And we can turn that into a mathematically defined problem called an assistance game. And it's somewhat similar to principal agent games, if you're familiar with that theory. Um, so you've got humans who have utilities and you've got robots who want to optimize uh, those utilities. So if you're a utilitarian, you would say you optimize the sum of utilities. Uh, you could be a prioritarian or some other kind of Aryan uh, and do slightly different um, optimization goal. But the key point here is that robots know that they don't know what those human utilities are up front. Um, so that creates a problem for, for the robots that they have to solve. Uh, and the point being that when they solve that problem, it's guaranteed to be helpful to us. Um, and systems that solve us, uh, solve these kinds of games, assistance games, are uh, going to behave in ways that classical AI systems with a fixed objective 
uh, can never uh, behave in those ways. For example, in uh, where it says willingness to be switched off, uh, an assistance game solver wants to be switched off if you want to switch it off because it wants to avoid doing whatever it is that's making you unhappy. It doesn't know what it is, um, but it wants to avoid doing it. And so it will be happy for you to switch it off to prevent uh, whatever it is that you don't like. Whereas a classical AI system with a fixed objective will never allow itself to be switched off because that would prevent it from achieving the objective that it knows is correct. And so assistance game solvers actually are uh, maybe the right formulation for the AI problem. Uh, and we can show that it's actually rational for us to build and deploy these solvers, if only we can do that. Next slide. Um, so there's lots of open questions in the theory of assistance games, and maybe the most important one is aggregation. Uh, so this is Thanos, and um, if you remember the movie, sorry, keep, keep him up there for a minute. Uh, so if you remember the movie, uh, Thanos uh, decides to get rid of half the people in the universe. Uh, why does he do that? Um, it's because he's calculated that if he does that, the remaining people <clears throat> will be more than twice as happy. And so he's actually maximizing aggregate utility in the universe according to his calculations. Um, and so this just goes to show that um, social aggregation has, has a number of open problems. Uh, and one of them is how do you deal with actions that can change the number of people who exist? Uh, this goes back to, uh, I think, Sidgwick in the 19th, cent 19th century, but it's one of the several open problems in social aggregation. And uh, what do we mean by social welfare? Uh, that we need to solve if we're going to build uh, AI systems that can affect the world on a global scale. Okay, let's go to the uh, step through these other things and we'll go to the next slide. So many other open problems uh, that uh, both philosophers and economists uh, and psychologists have studied. Maybe the most important other problem I'll mention is plasticity, the fact that human um, uh, human preferences are not fixed and autonomously acquired. Uh, they're plastic, they're malleable, uh, and they're often um, they're often created in us by other people for their own purposes, um, through, whether it's uh, through cultural or religious or uh, parental inculcation. Um, that plasticity. Uh, can be the source of uh, significant problems if we want to build AI systems, should they take our preferences at face value, uh, even if those preferences are something that have been inculcated for someone else's benefit. Uh, next slide. Okay, so you might wonder, you know, the big labs that are building all these AI systems, are they paying attention to these, these kinds of questions? Uh, and to a first approximation, the answer is no. Uh, so here's a quote from Sam Altman, uh, CEO of OpenAI, which built um, ChatGPT and other things. Uh, the vision is to make AGI, artificial general intelligence, the kind of AI that can take over the world, then figure out how to make it safe, and then figure out the benefits. Um, so it's quite clear that the goal is to create the AGI, uh, and whether or not it's safe when we create it, uh, that's something we're going to worry about afterwards, um, which is sort of like saying, yeah, I'm going to build a nuclear reactor in my basement, and then I'm going to figure out uh, how to make it safe. Well, you just wouldn't do that, um, but that's what we're actually doing. So it's kind of like playing Russian roulette with uh, the entire human race in one go. Okay, uh, next slide. Um, and just very briefly, uh, the, this is the last sort of uh, content slide. Uh, so large language models, as I said earlier, are trained to imitate human behavior. And, and this the, the particular behavior in ChatGPT is language behavior. Um, but uh, systems like Gemini also incorporate video and, and other, uh, other modalities. So in general, we're talking about imitating human behavior. 
And um, human behavior is generated by humans. And those humans have goals such as I want you to I want you to buy this product. I want you to vote for me. I want you to marry me. Right. There are lots of goals that cause us to produce language. And so if you are training something to imitate that behavior, then they're effectively going to acquire those goals. And so I asked Microsoft, uh, the, the, some of the lead scientists on, uh, on their, um, their part of the GPT-4 project, uh, what internal goals these large language models are acquiring. And their answer was, we have no idea. And then they deployed GPT-4 in the Bing chatbot. And um, there's a famous conversation with Kevin Roos, a New York Times journalist, where um, the Bing chatbot spends 30 pages trying to convince Kevin to leave his wife and marry the Bing chatbot. Um, and this is not a surprise, because that's one of the goals that are manifested by humans in some of the training data, uh, is they want to marry somebody. And so now you've got a system that wants to marry a human being. And this is an this is obviously an error, right? We obviously do not want AI systems that pursue human goals on their own account. Um, but that's an unavoidable error because we're using this method of imitation learning. Um, and so there's simply no real way to fix that problem. Uh, so a lot of the other techniques, they call it fine tuning and uh, RLHF, reinforcement learning from human feedback, these are ways of trying to counteract the bad tendencies that you've trained into it by, by training it to imitate human beings. Okay, so if you're interested in, uh, in some of these ideas, the book on the left is the non-technical version uh, explaining uh, how, to, how we think about AI and how to fix this problem of control over systems more intelligent than us. Uh, the right is the textbook, which has uh, lots of uh, meaty stuff about AI, but the fourth edition incorporates this new way of thinking about what we should be doing. Next slide. Okay, so, so that's it. Um, there's enormous potential upside, uh, but also uh, I would say sort of infinite downside if we create systems that we can no longer control. Uh, even if we do solve that problem, and I believe we can solve it, uh, it's still not clear how we coexist satisfactorily with systems more intelligent than us. Uh, and you can see this problem in science fiction that even if you look at the sort of utopias, right, um, they have a very hard time figuring out what human beings are going to do and what purpose humans have in life when the AI systems exceed us uh, in every dimension. Thanks. Thank you very much, Professor Russell. Um, I, uh, I'll start with, with some questions from the floor that are coming in. Um, so one question is about um, the way you, you laid out uh, the setting of objectives and making it more human compatible. Um, the question is whether it's sufficient to give the AI program the, the right objectives uh, that are then benevolent to humans. Um, and is it actually conceivable to appropriately constrain the means to reach those objectives? Uh, good question. So. I don't think it's possible for us to write down the objectives. And I think this is this is the important point. We call this the King Midas problem, right? Because King Midas said, I want everything I touch to turn to gold. That was the objective that he stated. And of course, it didn't work because his, then he couldn't eat and he couldn't drink and he couldn't touch his family members without everything turning to gold. Um, and, and we see this with AI systems over and over again, actually. Uh, you know, and sometimes they're funny. Uh, when we think we've specified an objective. Um, my favorite example is, is uh, a, a project on simulated evolution, and they, they wanted to evolve um, locomotion. And so they 
they set the fitness function to be what's the maximum speed of translation of the center of mass of the object. Right? And they thought that <clears throat> they would involve little legged objects that would run around very fast or something like that. What they actually evolved <clears throat> were um, trees that grew 100 kilometers tall and then fell over. And in falling over, their center of mass would move very fast. Uh, and so, yeah, it, it sort of optimized the objective, but it completely wasn't what they wanted. Uh, so it's really, really hard to specify objectives. And if you think about it uh, <clears throat> more generally, right, you, you're asking humans to write down a preference ranking over lotteries over futures of the universe, uh, which obviously is, is not feasible. Uh, and so anything you try to do, if you write it down wrong, then you're setting up a chess match, right? Now you've got a system that's pursuing an objective that isn't the future that you want. Uh, so you're automatically in conflict. Um, and there's, if it's more intelligent than you, it will succeed and you will fail. Uh, and, uh, and you lose that chess match. So, uh, so we want systems that know that they don't know what the objective is. And, and the rational way for those systems to behave is is first of all to try to learn more about what humans want, to infer as much as possible from human behavior, from you know, the textual record, from the structure of our civilization, all of which carry <clears throat> huge amounts of information about our preference structures. Um, but also, as they know that they don't know a lot about our preference structures, they will be much more cautious. Right? They, will, they will avoid changing the parts of the world where they don't know what, what we want that part of the world to be like. Um, and, and that's another mathematical theorem about their behavior uh, that oh. we, well, um, so, okay. Mm -hmm. So, so you, I mean, many of us on, on the call probably first time we're exposed to AI uh, with, with these large language models that you, you touched on, but, but beyond that, um, as you explained, AI is such so much uh, a much bigger field. What are some of the emerging trends you see in AI, and, and in particular, what are sort of recent breakthroughs in, in the field that you are particularly exciting about? Um, good question. I see that I didn't quite answer the second part of the last question. Uh, is it conceivable to constrain the means to reach those objectives? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a direction that is being pursued by some researchers, uh, that instead of optimizing, uh, one thing is quantalizing where you, you, know, you try to achieve just the 75th percentile uh, of, of the objective rather than the 100th percentile. Uh, and it has some good properties, but it still suffers from, uh, from bugs. And I think the, the assistance game, uh, at least as a theoretical formulation, is, is probably the right one. Um, Okay, sorry, I, I, now I've distracted myself. Um, the, the, the things that are going on right now, uh, there's two trends. So one is to say, well, look, we're very excited by the large language models and what they're able to do, but they exhibit a number of weaknesses. And so far we have found that by making them bigger, uh, we eliminate some of those weaknesses. So let's just keep making them bigger. And this is, you know, they use words like scaling laws as if this was some physics principle that, you know, that this will necessarily solve all the problems. This is purely an empirical observation. There's no theory behind scaling laws whatsoever. Um, and you can imagine two things happening, right? So uh, just to make a very simple analogy, suppose that, um, uh, we wanted to solve the game of Go by building a lookup table, right? Well, the full-size game of Go with a 19 by 19 board has about 10 to the 170 positions. Um, so we let's start with a smaller Go board. Let's start with two by two Go, right? I can build a lookup table of that, and now I'm really happy, right? And it that lookup table doesn't play a good game on a three by three board, so I'll scale it up. I'll build a bigger lookup table, and now I can play three by three Go 
right? And then I need, you know, another factor of 10 and I can play four by four go. Uh, and then I need two more factors of 10 and I can play five by five go, right? And now I'm up to, you know, a computer, you know, that that's a, a kilometer long uh, just to play five by five go. And, you know, and then I'm asking for, you know, a trillion dollars in funding to build a computer that can solve six by six go. But, you know, so I could say, oh, look, you know, these scaling laws show that as I keep building, uh, making the system bigger and more powerful, I'm solving more and more problems. I mean, yes, that's true, but you know where this is going, right? By the time you get to seven by seven or eight by eight go, you've covered the entire planet with a computer and you know you can't solve, you know, 19 by 19 go with this method. So is that what's going on, right? Are we going to hit a brick wall? Uh, or is something else going on that as you make these systems bigger, they're actually internally developing more powerful forms of learning and reasoning. And we haven't the faintest idea because we don't know how they learn or how they reason. Uh, so it's purely a speculative bet, right? Um, and uh, we'll learn a lot from the next generation because uh, you know, GPT-5, as it's called, we don't know actually what they're going to call it, but let's call it GPT-5, uh, will cost tens of billions of dollars in hardware uh, and, and a lot of electricity and so on to, to train. Um, and it will have pretty much used up all the text in the universe. Um, already for GPT-4, the publicly available text was not nearly enough. So they had to go out and buy lots of privately held text in order to train it. Um, but by GPT-5, you know, that's it. There is no more. Um, and so I think if, if they don't achieve AGI with GPT-5, uh, then, uh, then that particular direction has probably come to an end. Uh, but I think some some groups realize this, uh, both within OpenAI and in Google DeepMind. Uh, if you talk to Demis Asabis, who runs Google DeepMind, he will tell you, absolutely, we need more breakthroughs. Uh, and you know, he uses reasoning and planning as examples of things that large language models are just not very good at. Uh, and for reasons that are very clear, um, technically, uh, large language models cannot sit and think about the answer to a question. The, in, the input goes in and it's processed in a feed forward circuit and comes out the other end. And it cannot take any more time than that uh, to think. And so it cannot solve hard problems uh, unless you somehow get it to output its intermediate thoughts and then run it again and output some more intermediate thoughts and then run it again. So that's one direction people are taking is sort of wrapping a reasoning loop around a large language model and causing it to output its intermediate results uh, so that uh, it ends up solving the problem, you know, with a million iterations of input and output rather than just one iteration. Um, but then we're back in the same situation we always have been in AI which is that uh, you know, playing chess is difficult and you have to think very hard and come up with very intelligent uh, methods and algorithms and a lot of mathematical depth uh, in order to produce systems that uh, successfully solve really difficult problems. Um, mm. so we'll see whether uh, with the resources they have, they're able to make more progress. Yeah. Ah, thank you. So I wanted to take you uh, closer to, to uh, one of the jobs here at the central bank, which is to uh, uh, ensure financial stability here in Europe and keep the bank safe. Um, and a series of questions around this this topic. So, you know, what do you see are the, the main ethical and regulatory challenges associated with the use of AI in the financial sector? Um, if indeed all these financial institutions are going to build their own AGI models with with these perverse incentives, the way you lay them out, um, hmm. 
you know, what does this mean for for a regulator or a supervisor like like a central bank? Um, basically, do you have any hands how to approach this this problem from a regulatory perspective? Um, so, I mean, there are many, many applications of AI in the financial sector. Some of them are pretty mundane. You know, lending has been done, or so, at least some forms of lending have been done using AI since the 1960s. Um, and of all the sectors, it probably has the most experience with how do you ensure that lending decisions are not biased, uh, that be a, deniable, a denial should be explainable, and uh, maybe you can even fix your financial situation so that you can be approved for a loan. Uh, so that, I think, is reasonably well in hand. We've already seen, so trading systems um, have already caused market collapses. Um, there was a, an episode, I think it was 2011, if I remember correctly, where um, the algorithms got into some kind of doom loop and uh, wiped out more than a trillion dollars in value in about 20 minutes. Um, so, you know, since then we have put in circuit breakers, but we don't understand the dynamics of what happens. And these, these price deviations continue to occur, um, mostly confined to one or a small group of stocks. But again, we see, you know, in, in the space of now milliseconds, uh, you know, I, collapses or explosions in price uh, for, for particular securities. Um, that again are totally unexplained uh, and just have to do with algorithms that are interacting with each other in weird ways. Um, but uh, I think in the long run, you know, I, as we build in uh, more and more capabilities and we turn over more sort of management decisions to AI systems, we're going to face this problem of how do we specify the objectives. Um, and when you have many such systems interacting, you know, at, at microsecond or nanosecond timescales, uh, it's extraordinarily hard to predict the, the consequences of that, uh, especially when the systems are reasoning about each other uh, in a game theoretic way. So, um, so I, I think we have to be very careful. And a lot of people think that the, the likely way in which this all comes undone is not, you know, an AI system takes over the world and makes human beings extinct. That's one. There, there are many such scenarios, but but it's a sort of a systemic collapse scenario where um, where our our information ecosystem or economic systems, uh, as we turn over more control to AI systems, um, they simply malfunction. Uh, in a way that causes an unraveling of our highly inter interdependent economic structures. Uh, so I, I think if I was a, if I was a central banker, I would I would much prefer that AI be used to do modeling and forecasting, which I think can we can do a great job, particularly with some of the uh, the parabolistic programming tools um, that I mentioned, where and the advantage of those tools is we we can put in what we know. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's an enormous amount that we know about the structure of the economy. We know, you know, what are all the firms? We know where people live. We know what they do. We know how they move around. We can put all that knowledge in, uh, in in these modeling formalisms, um, and and then collect all the data and update with respect to all the data, and so on. Um, yeah. So you know, whereas just saying, okay, we want we want to maximize. We we, we want to keep uh, inflation below two percent, and then turn over the management of the global economy to an AI system. Uh, you know, there are many ways of getting inflation below two percent, including wiping out all the people. Right? Yeah. <laughs> They're the ones here, who are cool. Here. <laughs> don't don't want to go there. Um, we started a bit late, so uh, if okay with you, I would um, ask you two more questions. Um, one was triggered by 
uh, the quote, your quote of, of Sam Altman. Um, the question is, is it a good idea the way we're proceeding in Europe, which is we first introduced this European AI Act, which seems to have the goal to make AI developments, first of all, safe. Um, some have commented this may constrain innovation and technological progress. Um, more broadly, there seem to be very different um, approach uh, across uh, the Atlantic between the US and, and Europe in terms of how much technological progress there is and development, um, but also the regulatory approach. Um, any, any views on what is a sensible way forward and how should Europe react to that? Um, there's a lot of concern here of basically falling behind. Yeah, but uh, I mean, Europe fell behind mm -hmm. before the European AI Act uh, came to pass, right? And, and yeah. you know, at the same time, you know, Mistral and and Aleph Alpha and other examples show that there's nothing intrinsically uh, difficult that would prevent European companies from from doing this kind of stuff. Um, the problem is is completely clear if you look at the amounts of venture capital uh, yeah. that are deployed, you know, it's like 50 times higher in the US. And that's yeah. a decision for European banks and investors to make. Uh, and it doesn't have to do with regulation. You know, and if you, if you talk to the EU uh, tech envoy, um, de Graaf, I think his name is, he's, uh, he's here in San Francisco, uh, he'll give you many examples like in, um, in uh, uh, in telecommunications, it's much more regulated in Europe, and yet it's much more advanced and much cheaper in Europe, right? Um, when you look at Airbus versus uh, Boeing, right, the regulators in the U.S. relaxed their rules on Boeing. Uh, Boeing promptly killed 700 people uh, in two crashes of the 737 Max and almost went out of business. So by not re by not regulating and not following regulations, uh, they almost destroy the American airline industry. So, so all the people who say uh, regulation stifles innovation, right? They're all flying to meetings on highly regulated airplanes. They're eating highly regulated food, and they're using highly regulated internet to send emails to each other and post things about how terrible regulation is. Um, and it's true, the tech industry has been incredibly successful in avoiding regulation altogether, um, both liability uh, and even just ordinary, uh, you know, guarantees that products do what they're supposed to do. Uh, if you read the Microsoft Windows license, it says Windows doesn't do anything. Uh, Windows is entitled to steal all your data and send it to Microsoft um, or to your competitors, and there's nothing you can do about it. Right? And they get away with it because they have very expensive lobbyists who've been very successful. Uh, so I just don't buy this argument at all. Um, we have to, you know, as we do in medicines, right? We have to say, yeah, you can innovate as much as you want. But before you put it in the market, you have to show that it's not going to kill people. Mm -hmm. Right? And so there are things we don't want AI systems to do. And we should say, yeah, you can innovate as much as you want, but before you put it in the market, show that your system is not going to do those things. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So uh, my last question is um, as follows. So you, you said uh, I quite like this that the way you put that that you know the economics profession is finally waking up to some of these. Uh, uh, developments and uh, and also here at the ECB, we are increasingly pursuing analytical work, be it in the forecasting, uh, financial stability areas. Um, so so what kind of practical advice do you have for, for researchers in AI that are sort of new to the field coming maybe from, uh, let's say, econometrics background, or maybe more generally, what, what advice do you have for your own students uh, when they're interested in pursuing research in AI? Um, it's a, it's a, it's a real dilemma that I face because 
a lot of my students naturally want to get hired by the big labs. Yeah. Um, one of my students is entertaining offers from the three big labs right now that average 1.5 million per year. Um, so, uh, you know, and to get those offers, you need to know how to operate, you know, build and operate and improve large language models because yeah. that's the technology that everyone is excited about. But um, I think uh, it's very hard to do research in that area. Uh, and one reason is that you need, you know, $10 billion worth of hardware and uh, you can only find that in a few places. Um, so, but you can do research on smaller versions of the models and, and, and still get a pretty good idea of what's going on. But the problem is there's just no research to do, right? And the way, if it doesn't work, how do you fix it? You buy $100 billion worth of hardware. And that's just not very interesting from, from a research point of view. There's almost no underlying mathematics. You know, mm -hmm. gradient descent is, is, is all you really have to know. Um, and uh, um, there's, there's no depth of theory and there's no understanding of what's going on. Uh, I think one interesting direction actually is what we call mechanistic interpretability. So how do you uh, probe the internals of these systems in a systematic way um, to, to try to gain some understanding of what's going on um, or to, you know, or to fix them. But it, it turns out surprisingly that even though we don't understand what's going on inside, we can fix them. Right. So just one example, uh, you can fix a large language model so it thinks the Eiffel Tower is in Rome. <laughs> and so we've, we've learned how to do that. And then, you know, it consistently will act exactly as if the Eiffel Tower is in Rome um, because we've modified the internals of what you know, after training. But uh, we still don't really understand what's going on. So that's one interesting direction. Um, and it, it may end up being that we we have to treat these AI systems in the way we treat dogs and horses and to some extent humans, right? They're mysterious systems. They have functions and we've learned what their economic functions can be. And we've learned how to put them into systems so that they can carry out those functions successfully without messing up too much. Um, and, and so studying the economics of, of, of systems that are built out of those kinds of components um, could be quite interesting. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. Yeah, I was just thinking it's with this LLM type of research, research it seems almost impossible to, to meet the new replicability standards that most journals are introducing and uh, so it seems very hard to publish that kind of research but anyway I, I want to we've run a little over time I want to uh, thank you very much there's so much more to ask uh, thanks for whetting the appetite here and um, I want to thank everyone on the call for chipping in with questions um, and uh, Professor Russell you for for waking up so early and being so flexible and uh, looking for a new time to give this interesting talk um, it will be recorded and uh, it has been recorded, so uh, we will make sure that uh, other colleagues can also listen to it again if need be. So with that, uh, wish you all the best and um, we hope to welcome you at another opportunity uh, and another event here at the ECB later this year. Thank you very much. I hope to visit. Thank you very much and uh, thanks everyone for listening. Bye bye.